Hey guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are in the world right now. I would like to welcome you to these fast bowling conversations where I have a chance to sit down with a number of wonderful networks, friends I've made in the fast bowling community who might be coaches or researchers or in the strength and conditioning side and I get to have a conversation with them. So for me, this is a wonderful way that I enjoy learning when I can have a, a relatively <laughs> unscripted and authentic conversation with someone who has knowledge that I'm curious to dive into and we get a chance to see where the conversation takes us. So today, my good friend Simon Ferros, who was my first fast bowling coach, he's also got a PhD, so he's a doctor of fast bowling, which is pretty cool. He's a lecturer, so he teaches good stuff. And he's also a, a pretty funny guy, a bit of a goofball as well. Um, I have a lot of fun with Simon. When we first started coaching together, we would spend one hour doing our session and then we'd sit in the, uh, the Deakin car park in Warm Ponds and we'd chat for about two hours. There's some funny stories of his, his wonderful wife who, when she knew that it was me, he was coaching on a Sunday afternoon at, you know, three or four PM. She knew not to expect him home until later in the, uh, in the evening, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Simon definitely has some wonderful insights and it's really cool. I think to see all the tangents, all the interesting research that we touch on and how it can link into some practical coaching outcomes. And if you guys do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. I'll make sure I get back to everyone. I know these conversations are pretty long, but I do think that there's some pretty good insights in there. So I hope you enjoy. <laughs> oh, hang on. I, I love how you put a good behind you. Uh, should I should have done something like that? You know what I wanted to do? <laughs> What's that, mate? I wanted to put, I wanted to get a picture of Deacon Car Park. <laughs> get that as my background. Yeah. I could have got one for you today, but they've fucking blocked the car park off. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. Fuck yeah. That would have been perfect. I had this whole idea of, you know, we'd do like a, a, a video sort of blog with um, Stubbsy and Simon, and I'd have like that part of the car park. You'd have the other part of the car park. <laughs> and then we just talk shit like we always do. But man, I'm in London, so I don't can't go to the car park. <laughs> but shouldn't you be in isolation though for 14 days? Uh, you found yourself I in a wicked hotel. <laughs> isolation in London, in a wicked hotel. <laughs> I'm looking at Big Ben and, uh, you know, Tower Isn't of Big London. Big Ben scaffolded? Yes, correct. Um, I somehow found a way to resurrect it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a rich man. I'm like Thomas Wayne. <laughs> there you go. You just let them know. I'm on my way, and they just roll out the red carpet. Why well, wouldn't they? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Wish I had red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> fuck. Oh, what's been happening, mate? Oh, actually, today's been really good. I, because I've had so yeah. much free time on my hands, I reckon I've literally spent that much time like thinking about different things. And and um, I think I said to you before that like overall. I don't know even what to call it. I was kind of like an overall coaching philosophy, putting as big of a picture as you can up onto a, I started writing it out. I think I sent you some of those photos, but yeah. And then being able to use that to have some, yeah. something to come back to. Cause I thought, well, I, I like the idea of doing this cause I see everybody else doing it. I'm like, I want to talk to people and, and learn stuff. And then I think back to yeah. when we had some. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Some yeah. Really awesome car oh, park really. chats. Um, I think it's great. Um, yeah, like just just sharing information or thoughts or whatever it could be. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, no. it, it's just just what you're thinking today. Uh, yeah. What are you thinking today about fast bowling? No, a, that's that's perfectly fine. That's actually really generic, like yeah. not generic, um, genuine, like a yeah. organic, um, you know, conversation. And that's why I like this is not a planned. I know. <laughs> interview yeah you know yeah that, 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 i don't even know had to so, interview yeah oh no i oh, neither um you need to just have a conversation like it yeah it, it, it's, it's perfect and then what you can do is just snip this up in different segments and yeah release snippets here and there and i'll, I'll i could do the same if i have the footage yep. and then um, yeah definitely you know actually i'd prefer that i'm gonna have to try and edit it 
Yeah, um, anything's not too bad. Um, but when you, you know, people like it, they, you know, let the people speak, you know, they, yeah. If they don't like it, fuck it, we'll just keep doing it anyway. <laughs> no, absolutely. But, but yeah, no, it could be, could be good. Seriously. Got the beard's going well, mate. I know. I actually had it, I had it neatened up last week because it was getting pretty, pretty, uh, pretty crazy. And then, of course, I'm not yep. going anywhere, so I don't do the same. Same maintenance yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, People are yeah. going to come onto this and be like, "See, I should put, I should put together a clip of all the, um, all the, the Stubbsy and Simon banter and and chat into something, and then say how to ball fast." What, what an ebook or something? You reckon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's well big ebook. That includes so much of it. Oh god! But you shaved yours. Yeah, download all the. Um, we got to download the WhatsApp history, Instagram. Oh gosh! Fucking Facebook, you got to download all that, the transcripts of all the shit we've been Jesus talking about. It's on everywhere. Yes, yeah, and then put that into a book. It's free, free book. Of course, um, you'll have to try to work out our, our our like language <laughs> and communication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be. I um, it was three times thicker than this. Uh, believe it or not. Um, uh, oh, that's right. You did send me a photo. Yeah, look, it just gets. It's in the way um, when it comes to eating and drinking stuff. You know, it, it's a problem. Like I, I go have a drink of this coffee, and and like all of a sudden my beard's immersed into the coffee. It's like <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. do this. <laughs> you know what? I, I grew the whiskers out for oh, not this time, but I grew them out a while ago. And when I guess to a point when they get like that long, and then they always curl back around and end up in your mouth. <laughs> it, oh, it happened all the time, but I was I was committed. I'd like um, to think having a beard makes you look smarter. I feel like glasses. That's why I've done it, really, just to, to make myself look like I know what I'm talking about. How often do I sit here and stroking thy beard? I do it all the time. Thing. Joe's mum told me off. She was like, you always you always do this. I was like, I can't help it. It's, it's not very professional. Like, it doesn't look very good. Like, stop that. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> You'd be stroking something else. <laughs> 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 I should have went with that. <laughs> I just realised this is recorded. Oh, <laughs> I was going to do it a completely unedited version, just chuck it up there. Right. People will watch it and be like, are they going to talk about fast bowling yet? Like, can yeah, you know, no, what point does the... Until... Nah. This is just a fourth catch up. That's it. Yeah. Until the fourth, <laughs> the fourth or fifth episode. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Fast bowling. Yeah, sure. That's it, yeah. Oh God! So fast bowling, eh? Jeez. Um, where do you want to start with fast bowling? Well, I was thinking about the conversation. I went back after what we were talking about yesterday. I went back through some of the um, some of the videos because I I was looking at two bowlers with that that rear leg, like the rear hip flexion and the rear knee. One of the guys, I think Judge Pretty Boomer yeah. does this. That that leg's delayed. Do you know how like oh, okay. Brett Lee has the knees kissing? Um, yeah. Judge Preach is a little bit further behind. And I was having yep. a think about that ball release position at, at one point in regards to like um, the position your spine's in. Like if that back leg's kicked out, and, but then you're trying to flex forward as well and you're bending that way and then like rotating around. It's almost mm. like the top part of the spine's laterally or like flexing laterally and then going away. But because the pelvis is shifted back that way, it just seems yep. like things are going in different directions. And I wondered if that was something yeah there. um i look at um say paul felton's latest paper that's published it's he compared male and female fast bowlers and um for what we can see in that paper that the, the male bowlers in about 20 odd k or maybe a bit faster quicker than the females but they showed some certain biomechanical characteristics that were um uh they're quite different to the females and and one of those was looking at the rear leg i think from memory and that and um at back foot contact, I think there was more hip extension um, really? at that and point. So those bowls were tall. Women. I use that simple language again. Um, taller upon landing and not so collapsed. Because um, mm. when you collapse, then you're going to flexion of the hip and flexion of the knee. Mm. Um, and so I still think, you know, um, you want to be quite stable and stiff and you want most of your weight on that back foot to be sort of on the forefoot. Um, mm. So you don't want too much of your heel touching. One thing I noticed in that video you did send through the, the bowler was that they internally rotated the hip very well, that rear mm. leg, um, which is something we haven't talked about in a long time. 
Um, and I haven't seen anyone talk about internal rotation for ages. And probably the last person has spoken about it mm. online. But yeah, I think that's a really key thing. Um, and we know also that the guys that can have got great range of motion and hip internal rotation suffer less injuries as well. So it's yeah. an important metric for us. Um, but really, it just comes back to keeping tall um, and transferring your weight from back foot contact to front foot contact. And if you can um, get your front leg up high and then, and then bring it down closer to your body or your base, you're um, more likely to exhibit a straighter front leg, which is really important for bowling quick. Um, and that, the trunk will normally then sort itself out um, in terms of... I was thinking of, about that, you know? Yeah, the, the whiplash effect or the deceleration effect where yeah. if you have the legs straight, it just rapidly forces your opposite leg to come through. Mm. And it... it thrust your trunk forward now uh, yes the bowler is set up in the sort of slightly poor aligned position of the trunk at, in terms of at, at front foot contact so like if they've got the head falling away to one side yeah. at that point then obviously when all that huge impact happens that that whiplash effect they're going to go in that direction where they're yeah. at um rather than you know we want them to come forward a bit but like like you can't be fully forward either because um, you end up bowling really round arm. So you, you do need to, in my opinion, have some lateral flexion where you get a vertical arm release, um, but, you know, release for the ball. So then you can swing the ball both ways. So tactically, it's smart. Um, so we can't eradicate lateral flexion of the trunk. We need to have some in there. You don't want to get anywhere sort of past, when well, I say 45 degrees, um, as it seems to be, um, you know, a marker for risk of injury. Um, and we know it doesn't really contribute to pace a great deal. So you don't need to do excessive trunk lateral flexion. Um, but you, you do need to come forward more. So, you know, we say with batters, you know, it's really important to eyes, keep your eyes level so you can perceive where the ball's going to land and mm. or it's going to swing or cut or anything like that. You can, you can adjust quicker. Um, with the balanced head position, well, it's the same sort of thing with bowling. You, you, you want to keep your eyes as level as you can. A really hard thing to do when you bowl, as you know. Yeah. Um, but if you can keep your head still, normally um, that sets you up quite nicely. It's um, one of those nice cues, the, the head still. Yeah. When we ask a bowler, hey, can you bowl flat out? You see a lot of change. Like they, they, they get into some really ugly positions um, yeah. and they try and muscle the ball. Mm. down the wicket which is yeah. just it's it's not the way um when you, especially when you hear um you know the elite fast bowlers and um even guys i've had in my research they say that the quickest they're bowled is when they're not trying at all um and so it really makes you think of oh, what what should we be saying to these guys you know when we come a few really good thoughts about that as well the as fast as possible? you know is it really mm. is it really appropriate um and so some of the things you're talking about are really interesting technical characteristics but as you as you know and you've articulated online really well mm. there's a difference between knowing that and then coaching it and how you coach it oh i know one of those like pet peeves when when people can like identify um some sort of a flaw like the one i always get is my knees bending or like i'm falling away like but then I, if it's all good and well if you can identify things and everyone seems to have an opinion on like what's going wrong but if you don't yeah. have some sort of a solution like Shove yeah. your opinion up your ass. It pisses me off a little bit. <laughs> you know, I, I'm yeah. obviously not going to go and tell people that. You know, when I'm when I'm talking to them, but oh, that's that's frustrating. And that and that's one of those uh, things. Uh, I thought. We'll learn from our coaching, and I, I think I mean I'm coaching for a long time now, and I, I think for the most part I've done it probably the, the least efficient way, or the, the, <laughs> the least effective way. You know, um, it's surprising for me to say that, but. Um, it's not until you immerse yourself into um, motor learning literature mm. or research, just try and understand how we best learn skills. Yeah. Then when you realise, oh dear, we've got some learning to do as coaches. <clears throat> so, for example, we are very, like the, the, the fundamental stuff behind coaching, what typical fast bowling coaches do is they'll, they'll, they'll explain to a bowler to make a sort of adjustment to a particular limb like, mm. oh, get your knees straighter, and we're gonna we're gonna focus on something that's so intrinsic 
that the bowlers never had to do in their life. So, yeah. you know, they're now shifting their focus from taking tickets or trying to hit the off peg to now going, what the fuck's my knee doing? Yeah. You know, like, um, it, it, it is such a big shift. And then some coaches, and myself included, did this really well with you. It was, I gave you too many things to think about, which is a big problem. Um, well, I got all the education, so, so I didn't we, mind. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's it, it can really plague a fast bowler. So, um, it can get them overthinking, and we know that that leads to um, what it leads to is um, a lack of transfer in what they've learned to actually occur in training and in the game. So we don't have any research behind that, but we, we know that from coaching experience that the yeah. more you give someone to try and think about, the more they freeze, yeah. and they typically bowl slower yeah. um, because there's been too many things on their mind. So we've gone traditionally with coaching a very intrinsic um, approach in terms of look, focus on certain joints and this is where you want your foot to be in this position and, and all this really high level intricate detail <clears throat> and forgotten a little bit about who we're talking to and yeah. who, we're, who we're dealing with. So, um, you know, we're all very simple minded beasts. <laughs> we yeah, need to keep it as time. simple as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, and like, so that means shifting the coaching from being intrinsic to extrinsic, which yeah. means, you know, moving away from thinking about joints, but more about maybe movement patterns or the objective you want the bowl to be able to do down, like down the other end. It could be, I'll give you an example. So I coached a young kid around here a few years ago who was having trouble swinging the ball. And I could have easily said to him, oh, look, you know, let's look at your grip. Let's adjust your finger position. Um, wrist position at release and all this sort of stuff. You need to have your, for an hour swing your wrist, you know, yeah. facing this way. I could have gone into all these details about thumb pressure, mm -hmm. finger pressure and all that sort of stuff. But I didn't. I chose something different for once. I went, okay, can you just high five first slip for me? I Pretend love that. First yeah. slip there. I want you to high five. You know what? First thing he did, he did it and he swung the ball and I, I shocked myself as a coach. I went, <laughs> holy hell, worked. And then I said, well, the in-swing is with high five, fine leg, you know. Yeah. And that was an analogy that resonated really well. And what it done is it combined a lot of these little things into one mm. movement pattern. Yeah, that's that it. was relatable. We've all had to high five first slip when we take a wicket, right? Oh, definitely. So, um, yeah, exactly. So it's relatable and it creates less rules mm. on, on the bowler, which means less mental processing. And from table tennis research, what it's found, if you use this uh, analogous um, approach to coaching, which is you coach with analogies, um, and Love it's analogies. called implicit learning. Yeah, analogies, wonderful. Implicit learning, all really good stuff. What it does, it creates less rules on, on the bowler's head. So they have to think about where's my arm at, where's my leg at, where's mm. all these things. These are all these rules. When it comes to a game and they're under pressure, um, they have all these rules and they crumble because they're not aware of the, the, the environment they're in, for example, um, and what the field settings might be. They're not paying attention to all these little finer details or assessing a batsman, for example. So when you, when you create less rules for, for a bowler, that, that means that they, could, they free up their attentional resources in their brain to devote to problem solving other things. Mm. And those other things in a game are much more important than technique, as we know. So, you know, the ability to outsmart a batsman, um, you know, to be aware of field positional changes that the captain might have made, um, all that stuff. Um, you need to be able to devote your time to that. We all know from our experiences, when we've thought about technique in a game, we're shot. We've barely oh, yeah, it kills you. It absolutely it's destroys you. Yeah. But one, <laughs> we know the same. Trainers play. Why, why, are we, why are we then, in coaching getting to focus heaps on technique by, mm. by, by verbally saying it or getting, oh, you want to put your knee in this position or you want to put your back foot in this position and all this sort of stuff. Why are we mm. doing that if we know that we, we don't want them to think about it come game time? Yeah. And so we've got to be smarter to get these things to happen so quickly. So yeah. that's up to us coaches to be really good. Um, and so whenever we have a duty, whenever we write about something, whenever we coach something, we have to be very mindful that we don't want this to take over the brain of the fast bowler um, because then it can plague them come game, game day. Mm. All for what? Maybe 2Ks increase in speed? Like really? Yeah, that's it. it. 
one of those things I was, I was having a chat with people yeah. about, um, you know, especially you see it like that, like subcontinent, everyone wants to bowl faster, you know, and it's almost like, yep. do you want to bowl faster or do you want to be a better fast bowler? And that's why I enjoyed the whole, you know, the four pillars sort of thing. Cause you yeah. can sort of use that as a conversation that that's, that's looking at performance, but then you can sort of have some yeah. conversations go and look, we can look at your technical side for sure. And see if we can draw it, squeeze a bit more lemon out of that. But then you yeah, also look, have to remember the rest. Six, you're, you're, you know, you're going to have to develop other skills and qualities, you know, I know. Uh, even at 160, there's going to be some top order bats who might be able to handle it today. Um, at the elite level. So you've got to have a bit more than just bowling straight and down and bowling 150. I mean, don't yeah. get me wrong, it's fantastic and I, I would love to have been able to do it personally. But Everyone would. <laughs> I, you know, our experiences are, I, I, I mean, as me as a kid coming through pathways cricket, I relied too much on pace um, yeah. to develop, you know, to, sorry, um, to bash my way through um, smaller batters, you know, all that mm. sort of stuff that was a, False sense of security. Um, mm. well, I, I thought, oh, pace. You know, pace is king. Pace is yeah. king. That's fine. So then I get to senior cricket playing, say, first grade in, at 16. And then I realised that pace was not the king yeah. unless you could bowl extraordinarily quick um, mm. because they just picked you off. That was no problems. So you had to have some craft about you, um, which I love that term that Kevin, that Kevin Schoen uses, craft. You know, yeah. craft of bowl. It's a nice I think term. it's a great, great term. Like... Develop your craft, your arsenal, your kit bag, whatever you want to call it. You've got to have these things up your sleeve. Mm. Um, and, you know, one thing that was brought to my attention early on was slower balls. And I, I, I remember, like, I had one really good slower ball and I just banked on that uh, when I had yeah. to do a change out in speed. And the coach said to me one day, um, how many slower balls you got? I was like, I've got one. He's like, one? Is that all? And I'm like, yeah, well, what's wrong with that? You know, uh, he's like, you probably should have three. And I'm like, mm. you're kidding me. Three slower balls? He's like, yeah, you probably want one that's a big change up and probably change down in pace, one that's not so um, you know, big of a change, and then one in between. Um, but in case, you know, one of your slow balls doesn't really come out well on the day, um, then you've got another two you can possibly go to as well. So um, yeah, I love that. There you go. There's an example of building your, your arsenal. But I talk to so many fast balls, and they only have one or two. Um, slow. It's like the whole swing the ball, you know. I think swing the ball is such one of those skills that everyone should be able to swing the ball. I was listening. Yeah. I was, there was a, there was a, a, one of those video sort of things between Nasser Hussain, James Anderson, Dale Stain, and they'd like a, an interview or a conversation, something like that. And um, and James Anderson said he he didn't learn to swing the ball until he went to county cricket. And I sort of sat yeah, there okay. and thought, you're kidding, right? The dude who's like <laughs> the the king for Swing the ball didn't yeah. learn it until county cricket. And I sort of sat there and thought, you know what? Uh, I, because I probably look so much at the technical side and then leave the skills. I mean, I guess it depends how much, how long a bowler wants to come into a session for. But I just think every bowler should learn how to swing the ball. And, you know, just putting some cones down the wicket or those like those poles and saying, move it through there. Well, how easy would that be to do at any single club training session? where you might get guys on a Tuesday or yeah. even on a Thursday at a bowl four or five overs just working on something, you think? That's such a yeah. valuable skill set. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, I think I think we, cricketers in general, have been caught up in the environment they've been brought up in. Mm. Well, most of us have developed skills based on the, the, you know, all our backyard cricket experience, for example. But also just, I'm talking more about the pitch conditions and weather conditions that, they're different in other countries. So, you know, yeah. you look at New Zealand and England, typically overcast conditions, nice green outfield, perfect for maintaining the quality of the ball, perfect yeah. to swing bowling, generally mm-hmm. speaking. Come to Australia, you've got abrasive, hard surfaces, um, dry outfields, ball gets scuffed yeah. up. You, and this is why we see so many bowls in Australia that hit, that as seam bowls who, who just want to hit the deck. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good swing bowls around there. Absolutely, yeah. there's some, but they like, get picked. No, unfortunately not. There was only one case I can really remember where Darren Lehman, you know, former head coach of Australia, sent a, a couple of swing bowls over to New Zealand for a, a tournament over there and, and said it was horses for courses, which I thought was absolutely brilliant from a selection mm. point of view. Um, Realised that there was going to be some swing bowling on offer over there. So we need to pick some swing bowlers who can actually do it. 
because it's the late movement in the air off the pitch that causes trouble with the batsman. And look, if you can do it five, ten k's quicker than the next bloke, okay, you should get the selection, right? Yeah. Um, because it's just even harder to react to. But you don't need to swing it a great deal or cut it a great deal. You just need to um, get some movement. And it's the subtlety um, about it all. If you get big hooping out swingers or in swingers right from the hand, you're easy to face. And it comes out here usually. Um, there. Yeah, the old hooping sorry, houses. You know, tip yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, he, when, he get, when he was getting faster in, you know, throughout his career, the ball wasn't swinging as much, which is what we normally see, which is perfect. You don't want it hooping too much. Yeah. Um, because it's so much easier to read. But granted, the bat, batter still has to deal with it. Mm. Um, but the earlier it swings, the more it's on their radar, for example. So um, they can normally fend it okay. Um, so I remember chatting with Colin Miller when I was 16. Mm. Uh, and... Some of some of your listeners might have no idea who Colin Miller was. Well, he used to have <laughs> blue hair, and he used to be I know a okay. fast bowler down in Footscray. Um, I think from memory, Footscray, he was playing, and then he then he gave that up and turned into an off spin bowler, and then played for his country. How um, crazy is that? Colin Funky Miller said yeah. to me that if you want to get late swing, you need to get more backspin on the ball. So you've got to really flick it, you flick your wrist, and get backspin on the ball. Apparently, the more revolutions means that it um, somehow the ball will swing later in its flight. I don't know the exact science behind it, yeah. um, but I thought that was very interesting because that's something that we often talk about being really important, being late swing. Yeah. Um, and that, no, that's for steam bowls. Well, you've just got to present the seam, you know, in a nice vertical position and then let natural variation do its trick. Um, mm. There are some seam bowlers who seem to get the ball to cut certain directions all the time and that's obviously because of they might be putting you know a side cut on the ball um but i found when i had to do that i lost a lot of pace um because i was really running my fingers down one side too much um yeah. so they put slower balls but um yeah you got it like it's a, a, i think a lot of it does come down to your action those yeah. guys who can get the ball cut off the wicket a certain way all the time i think it's really just their release point is a certain position for the ball to just be angled nicely for the same to, to deviate i wonder um, that yeah, because I faced a guy back as a, when I was a, in genius. It was a senior, senior fast bowler, and he could always get the ball to nip away every time. It's a pain mm. in the ass. It's so hard to hit. And um, I often wondered, how did you do that? Like that's that's he's bowling a, a a leg cutter every delivery. Like it's so hard to face um, and adjust, especially if he gets it on the good length. Mm. Um, so this wicket sit. Um, if you can bowl a really good leg cutter um, or an outswinger, there's often wickets up for grabs everywhere. I mean. It's just so hard to deal with. And I said, you know, before, if you can do it at pace, you know, 140k an hour, um, you're going to be handful for most um, for most batters. So movement in the air off the pitch is is critical. Um, but one of the mistakes I probably see kids doing is that they try and learn everything in one go. They try and oh, outswing, in swing up. So it's probably the other way to how I was. I was mm. brought up with stock ball. And um, you just want to have a stock ball that you can go to and know that you can execute, you know, um, 95% of the time. And that stock ball for me was an outswinger. Um, I didn't have it like, oh, 40% outswing, 40% inswing, you know, 10% cutters, all that sort of stuff. It wasn't, that wasn't me. Um, and so when I found that I bowled the odd slow ball or something, I got put away or something like go back, go back to the um, stock ball, the one that gives you confidence. Um, because that's really important. When you, you, if you string six good balls together, and then, and then you know another six, and you're building pressure, your confidence also escalates. Um, and we know how important confidence, confidence is for a fast bowler. Um, mm. So I mean, the importance um, of stock ball, we need, we we must have one. I reckon because yeah. uh, all the batting and stuff that people do these days, where it's you know, I feel like now there's such a, a shift to um to learn a bunch of different batting skills. You know, learn learn your sweep shots, learn your reverses, learn your ramps, that sort of stuff. I, I wonder if that's almost fed into fed into fast bowling coach in a sense. But I also think I've always thought it almost goes too far the other way when you get coaches who probably don't um, have that much of an understanding of fast bowling and just say, you know, bowl your stock ball or just hit top of off, you know, and then you get bowlers who never develop uh, a more complete skill set. Which you know, I think it'd be great yeah, if I think, with a bumper well, Yorker. Well, yeah, going back, 
so you got that extreme, which I think is, is extreme, and it's very much a simplistic approach to, to fast yeah. bowling. And, and don't get me wrong, simplistic is really important, but um, we have to be um, aware yeah. of of the development of our players. You know, that awareness um, is so important. This comes down to the overall, uh, the overarching plan. You know, when we yeah. when we start a season, we do goal setting, we do all these great things. The coaches will chat. No one ever uses them. goal setting. Gosh, that's there's it's, another little little pet peeve. Important things we can do yeah. is, is just have a bit of a plan. So, from your developmental perspective, what would you like to be able to learn or achieve this year? Now, the answer doesn't have to be five k extra in pace, like a lot of people might want. I want to pick up a yard, or you know, it could be something I want to I want to master a new slower ball. All mm. right, that, that is about fifteen k's different to my normal ball. Um, it could be, I want to learn how to bowl an in-swinger. You know, it can't just be you rock up the training one night like I used to do and, and then just go, oh, I'm just going to work on this and then go home and then not work on it ever again. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we must deliberately practice. That's a really important thing. Um, you know, and so going back to your discussion around batters learning different shots and mm. being versatile cricketers and playing 360. Um, yeah. I remember um, a coach at a Victorian coaches forum thing one weekend got up and presented on um, their preparation in uh, in terms of types of shots played by all their batters um, and how they would go in the season. And one of the comments he made was he actually planned all the different types of shots he wanted batters to play in the preseason in terms of the number of shots um, and have quite an even distribution. Now, yeah. You see most batters just working on front, front foot defence or cover drives. Cover drives drive. for days. Well, yeah, off drives, cover drives, whatever it could be, leaving the ball. You know, they, they typically practice a lot, but then when it comes to like a pull shot, cut shot, mm. you know, those more aggressive type shots, how often they get in practice. And, th- and this gentleman, he made a really good point is that um, first game, one of the opening batters went out to play in a, uh, he played a pull shot. Skied up in the air, didn't go anywhere. Straight up in the air, got caught, dolly of a shot, and comes off the ground. And coach says to him, I "Wonder why you went out? What 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 happened?" And he goes, "Ah, oh, just didn't connect." And he go, and the coach said, "How often have you practiced this shot in the preseason?" <laughs> and he said, "Oh, not often." And we we wonder why then. We wonder why it didn't go to plan. You know, didn't count. Didn't count the number of shots he played on it. Now, so you don't have to be that meticulous, but if you if you plan it, um, you'll get the results your way eventually. And so with fast bowling, it's no different. You know, um, we should be thinking a little bit about the structure of our net sessions and, and yeah, even our warm and, and thinking a little bit about, okay, I want to devote, you know, a third of my deliveries in this training session towards learning this new craft. Mm. Um, and I'm going to do this for a number of weeks. I'm just not going to do it on a one-off. I'm actually going to have some long-term vision here in place that in, you know, in six years' time, I want to have this sort of skill set or whatever it could be. You know? um, that is, I want to have a really good outswinger. That's my stock ball. But I also want to have these, these other weapons I have on the side that, that, mm. the, in the bag that I can use at certain times. You know? um, different tools you know, um, to solve the problem at hand. Um, and... If you can have that mindset of long-term thinking, then you will see more patience at the craft. You, you'll see cricketers realizing that they're here for the long, the the long game. It's a marathon, yeah. not a sprint. Now, I don't know about you, but as a kid, for me, I was hopeless like that. I, I, I'd rock up and maybe, yeah, like I said, one training night. <laughs> I'm going to try the back of the hand slower ball, and that was it. That was the end of the back of the hand slower ball. I might do it again next season, or you know, it was just inconsistent. You know. We, Consistency is the key. You know, we, we, we want, um, it's like brushing your teeth. You know, we, we're told we should do it twice a day. Mm. And it's, it's not like, it's no good you going six months without brushing your teeth and, and then brushing them a hundred times, you know, in one day, thinking that you're oh, going to make up for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same with our skills. You know, yeah. you don't use Couldn't it. You use it. Um, you you yeah. really do. So it's consistency. Um, if you want to get good something, you need to practice and practice often and deliberately practice, not just 
full practice. Oh, I'll just rock up one day when I feel like it and then have a go. You need to dedicate some time to this. This is one of those um, things I think, I think people yeah. could, you know, say, say when we do put some sort of workshop together, it's this sort of an awareness that I think it just take any fast bowler really and just take them yeah. like next level because it's, it's, I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, the, the sorts of things that we can present on and, 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 and help people to understand or even just like the takeaways that they can go and take with them. And, you know, it's, yeah. when you go to training, you know, and you're probably going to bowl six to, to 12 overs, you know, how many of those are you going to make Yorkers? How many of those are you going to make slow balls? How many of those are you going to, yeah. are you going to attempt to, to do something? And then how often are you actually looking at the batsmen you know, and say, so looking at where their head goes, looking at where their back foot goes, the, the, the sorts of things that you can sort of easily pick up and try and get them out. And just yeah. that in itself is like your tactics pillar. And then you can yeah. look at some of the other things that, that we can sort of deliver on. I reckon really any does. bowler could go from... Oh. Yeah. It does depend on the, um, you know, the age of the bowlers as well. You know, I, I agree with Craig Victoria's position on the four pillars, you know, they, they enact on those four pillars as well. So, mm. you know, we've got technique, physical preparation, tactics, and mental performance. Yep. Um, but they're in a certain order. And um, well, I agree. I think technique comes first. Um, and it's worked on at a very early age. And, and we sort of try yeah. and, as best as possible, lock it away if we can. Like, yep. I'd like to think if we started all over again, learning how to bowl oh, yeah. six or seven or ten or whatever it could be. Yeah. Imagine, you know, the things we know now, what we'd actually mm. be doing back then. And, and a lot of this would be ingrained. The stuff that we know about the straight front leg and delay bowling arm and run up and all this sort of stuff. We, we, we would be coaching, we'd be doing that. And now we wouldn't have to worry about it. It'd be locked away, you know. Yeah. And now our attention would be more devoted towards the things that are more important, mm. arguably, tactics, sorry, physical preparation, tactics, and then mental performance. Yeah, mental performance for me is is the key. Um, yeah, especially when you get to that level when everything else is considered equal. Well, then the yeah. guys that that have that mental side, they're definitely going to execute their skills far better than someone who's going to yeah. collapse under pressure. I love the yeah, mindset I can talk. Find myself coaching more on this front today these days than I do on any other front. Um, half half my messages are pro probably around that sort of thing. Whether it's to to yeah. to the women that I coach in the gym. Yeah. around different areas or the, the guys that, you know, how do I overcome bowling a wide or we'll bowl it at off stump? So yeah, or I bowl faster in the nets than I do in the game. Look, yeah. That's mental, man. That, yeah, I, so was mental. That too. I, I had days where I was pedestrian out in the middle Yeah, and my captain came up to me and said, what's wrong? I was like, I don't know. No, <laughs> it's not coming out today. I was like, oh, fire up, mate. Like, you fire up in the nets. You, know, you bowl with no fear in the nets. Why do you yeah. bowl all this? Yeah. Mm. And it was really interesting like started looking within and i had a lot of people say they have the same problem um this is actually a really good discussion because you know it, once we can unlock some of those those core things that exist in here regarding why do we hold back mm. fear of failure yeah. uh, why do things change now that we've gone from a net environment to a game environment what what are you now worried about the results or, or, or all that sort of stuff um mm. for me we talk so much how important the mental side is, yet how often do we coach it? Um, and how often do we work on it as players? Now, yeah. I, I feel it receives the least amount of attention from a training perspective. Um, and we devote more, typically, of our training time towards physical preparation and technique. Now, yeah. if we follow the, the pillars, they're not all pillars are created equal, right? That We follow this hierarchical model of pillars now. We've got four of them, but they're not... You know, it's 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 not um, they're not of equal height, in my opinion. I feel that and at different age groups and different like yeah, levels of ability as well. Yeah, probably have absolutely. But I think um, the earlier you can get on to the mental side of things and understand routines, consistency, mm. mental preparation, in in learning, being a bit more aware about when you when you're in the zone, um, yeah. which is a phenomenon, which is. Um, I've only happened to experience uh, maybe a handful of times at best um, where you felt you couldn't put a foot wrong. Um, you were not aware of anyone in the car park, for example. Yeah. Like, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember mum, mum turned up and watched you one day and I made a hundred and mm. um, I had no idea she was there. Like I, I had no idea people were clapping and no, I was just in the zone. Like yeah. there's days you hold it and you're just oblivious to what's happening around you. You're in, you're in the zone. Now for yeah. me, that's, that's, that's that such is, an important thing. 
that is the best thing you can be in. Um, my performances will always peak when they're in the zone. It's the same with other athletes. Now, the big question is, how do you get in the zone? Now, I did sports psychology at university and so on, and we learn about the zone. And a lot of it comes down to, from what I've learned, is routines and yeah. not overthinking things. So this is why it's important in training we don't breed overthinking. So you care yeah. what you plant in that head. So, you know, I was, you, you were like a guinea pig, unfortunately, for, for when I was coaching you. I, was, I, 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 I now say sorry for telling you. <laughs> no. Mate, I got... <laughs> I had two hats on it, you know, and, and you know, yeah, you I, I know, well, but it's a mistake to, I mean, you've got to pick your person as well. So, you know, yeah, definitely. Are interesting. Like I'm an overthinker. So I mean, I did a PhD and you know, that lends itself to a lot of thinking about concepts yeah. and um, someone like me, it's dangerous. You know, you give me a bit of information about what I'm doing with my body. I will run to the hills with it and then I'll study it for probably three years. Yeah. Um, and wonder what <laughs> I'll, I'll be a doctor on it. I might, I might go to London and, 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 and present on it. Yeah. Or, 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 Perfect. You know. it, 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 I'll it, join. It's, like, it is, it's terrible. Like you, you, yeah. But there are some people who don't. It's like water off a duck's back. You know, you tell them, like, yeah, cool, man, whatever. Um, <laughs> didn't really want to know. Or, yeah. Yeah, all well, that was interesting, but they don't dwell on it. So, they're, those people you can afford, I reckon, to get away with saying a little bit more if they're interested in knowing about it. But the ones mm. who overthink, you can tell, you can see the cults ticking over. Yeah. Um, it's dangerous. Um, I've got some good examples about that. I, I, ha I had this idea in my head of almost like um, caricaturing, you know, different types of like bowls. And you've got like, you know, this guy, the overthinker. How do you manage that from a psychology? You've got this guy, the... Um, the guy that, you know, goes from zero to lost it in the space of like three balls and then can't seem to find his way back. And I, yeah. I started thinking, yeah. you know, because I have one guy who, who does overthink yeah. everything and, you know, he's curious. And having like gone through it myself, yeah. one of the things that I said to him was like, you know, you are someone who's going to want to think things through. That's okay. But there's going to be times when you're going to have to go back to the simple thing that you've got to focus on. And that's what you'll yeah. have to train. Whereas the dude who... You know, yeah. I'd say as a conference bowler, yeah. that conference bowler who loses confidence really, really quickly, they're going to have to almost put a bit more of a thinking yeah. cap on. And when they start bowling three short balls or get whacked, they're going to have to think about, what did I do? I bowled three short balls and got pulled, pulled away three times. Maybe if I bowl the next ball fuller, yeah. it, I might not get hit before and they can sort of let the emotions dissipate. Yeah, I, um, I work a lot with kids um, and... I look heavily into their reactions, um, body language. I was a very poor exponent of body language. I'd, I'd wear my emotions on my sleeve. So what about your kids now? I get hit for four. Ah, oh, effort, you know. Yeah. Fuck me. Can't believe that happened. <laughs> I, I walk back, head shaking, a bit of Shane Watson like, you know, a bit like yeah. just, oh, rah, just disappointed, just like, what am I doing? Yep. And so obvious what, you know, a, bats, bat, a batsman looking at me and going, oh, I've won already, you know, like he's his own worst enemy. Mm. Um, so I, I'm very cognizant, aware of that with bowlers. And I, um, I have a good little strategy to do in, you know, group training sessions and nets where I'll get the bowls to feed off each other. Um, I get them to be accountable to each other. So when they're mm. about to bowl the ball, I, I get them to turn around to the bowls behind them and say, this is the ball I want to bowl. Yeah. Um, that off move use. So credit. Yeah, to that's right. I think because I, I think I took that off you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it works really well. But I get them to cheer each other and to high five each other. Yeah. And we don't just talk about hitting the top of off stump. We talk about knocking, you know, smashing the stump out of the ground. And we use really emotive or you know, just descriptive language like that to, to bring about powerful feelings and yeah. a, a dominance and brutality. And all. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, Every fast bowler needs that. It's, Otherwise, yeah, it spin. is great. And I, literally, you know, I did one session at Geelong College and I'm a casual bowling coach out there now. Um, and we had, I had a group of kids I was working with in one net. And before I made this mental intervention, um, mm. I was watching them, you know, and... I, I gave him a task, you've just got to hit the top of off stump. Now I'm missing the top of off stump and so on. A lot. You know, the frequency was selling, like hitting it 15% of the time. It was mm. pretty poor. And then I brought them all in and I, I, I said, you guys are probably overthinking it. 
um, you've, you've, in your careers, you've, you've probably hit the top off start many times in training, in, in a game, without even thinking about it, you just do it. So all I want to do is just knock that bloody stump out of the ground. Um, and I want everyone to get around, get around, you know, when you, when you do it. Yeah. And you should have seen it. They were hitting, I think they probably got nine or ten in a row as a group. It was incredible. Wow. It just went from a really poor conversion to straight. And yeah. I'm not lying. This is just incredible. It was the power of positive thinking. Now, yeah. I've seen it work and I've seen the, the effects of bowlers rallying around each other. Mm. And this is really, really important because that can carry into game day. If, you, if you're a good collective in the nets and you work together, uh, I'll give you another example of working together in the nets. Um, normally when we bowl the nets as individuals, we have our own things that we're doing. We're in our own little bubble. Um, yeah. We roll in and some bowls don't even think about what they're bowling, which is a mistake for one. But anyway, mm. roll in, just bowl. And you might be accountable to the person behind you and you might have said something, but you're really just doing your own thing. Yeah. Um, often great results with getting the bowlers to work as a team in that net. How they're going to bowl to those two batters or the one mm. batter that's in the net. Yeah. What, first thing I ask him, all right, new batter comes in. All right, boys, girls, what what do you know about this batter? You obviously played with them for a, a while. Um, yeah. What are their strengths, what are their weaknesses? Oh, a couple of pipe ups. Oh, so I'm, you know, he's, he's really weak on, you know, on cover drives, for example. All right, well, what's the plan going to be? And mm. so as a collective, we come up with a plan and, you know, what, you know we're, we might be bowling a certain length or line. And then one of them in the group said, well, I'm going to do the change up to try and catch him out or, or whatever. Um, and that works really, really well. It gets them working together, which is what yeah. we should be doing better on game day, not just relying on... Yeah, the- for sure. It's always a partnership game. It's in, Look, cr- cricket's one of those funny sports, isn't it? Where you've got, um, you know, uh, it's a team game made up of individual brilliances or performances. But yeah. we talk importance of partnerships now i think this is a bit elusive like people don't really know what does that mean you know we, batting it's a bit easier to put your finger on yeah um bowling i'll give you a great example of bowling partnerships is what i'm just talking about working together bowlers <laughs> opening bowlers talking to each other um and complementing each other with certain skill sets so when i yeah. played regional i was the outswing bowler i opened up the bowling the guy down the other end um he was an in-swing bowler and uh, together, we were a really interesting combo. Um, uh, I think it challenged batters. They didn't. They didn't just get two outswing bowls that looked the same. Yeah. Um, so we talk about partners and pairings. We think of. We often think of, you know, McGrath Warren. You know, one of the best yeah. bowling partnerships ever. Um, you know, um, why was it so effective? They were, they, were, they worked really well together in in building pressure. Mm. Um, and and I think that, that ultimately comes back to consistency. It wasn't about how many revs Warnie could put on the ball necessarily. It wasn't all about how much pace McGrath bowled. We know he wasn't all that quick when he got yeah. older. It was all about consistency and having a clear plan. You know, what are we going to do with these guys we, you know, mm. we're, we're bowling towards? Warney, his mental, his mental game was far, by far the strongest out of any bowler I, I saw. And mm. I've listened to so many interviews of him. And one thing that stands out was... If he got hit for four or six, his mindset was, look out, I'm going to get you next mm. ball. It wasn't, oh, my God, what have yeah. I done? It was game on. You're, yeah. you're playing the shots I want you to play. And then all he would do is just drag the ball out a little bit wider, a little bit wider to try and suck him in and yeah. get him stumped or nicked, nicked off or whatever. It was just brilliant. He didn't think about where he wanted the ball to land. He thought about the shot. Yeah. He wanted to just I play. love that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Different mindset. You know, and I used to think that when as an outswing bowler, I'd always be walking back to my marketing and, and always be doing this as I walk back to my yeah. mark. It was like, <laughs> it wasn't half obvious what I was trying to get the batter to do. Yeah. But, you know, I'd, I'd take cover out or mid off out and go, mate, there's four bickies there for you or yeah. six if you really want to take me on. Mm. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you nicked off. That's, that's, that's a high risk game. You know, in the yeah. pursuit of leaking runs, I'll take wickets. And yeah. that's how Warnie me. <laughs> Very aggressive mindset. Um, but ultimately, we know containing runs is important, yes, but taking wickets is the best way to contain runs. Absolutely. So if we can, if we can take wickets, that's our objective. Our primary objective as a fastball or any yeah. bowler is to, is to take wickets. Um, I have played under a different style and I, I wasn't quite a fan of that style, which was 
um, you know, bowl, you know, a foot outside off stump and really contain. Um, yeah. I remember one day we went out and did it and I struggled naturally with this because I was always taught to attack the stumps because um, yeah. it opens up more modes of dismissal. So it didn't sit well with me, but I tried to adhere to the captain's request. Um, I struggled a little bit, but I remember at tea they were one for 140 mm. um, or something like that. And they, at the end of the day, they didn't. They weren't even all bowled out. They made like 300, 400 runs or something. It was the most miserable day of cricket I've ever played <laughs> because of this whole defensive bowling. You know. Yeah. yeah. Like, honestly, I went back in the dressing room. I spoke to a senior fast bowler who is probably 60 odd now. I said to him, he didn't play that game, but he he was watching us on another game. And I said to him, mate, I don't agree with this philosophy. I think it's shit. Yeah. Um, got to we got to attack pegs, and he's like, I completely agree with it. And he's someone who took over 700 wickets for the club. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I just thought, look, tack the pegs. Um, give the bowler some freedom to put yeah. in the field when they want to field. Because I always felt when I captained and I had control over the field, I always did better as a bowler. Yeah. I knew what I was bowling to. I had certain plans, etc. I think we talk about partnerships and we often talk about bowlers from being, you know, bowl A, bowler B, batter A, batter B. But we forget about coach and athlete partnerships too we can't we can't forget about that so or captain yeah athlete we've all yep. said we've got a coach that we love playing for we die for yeah we've fortunate we might have had one of those in our career that yeah. was just isn't that so would, true i wrote that up as like part of the almost like one of the overriding principles of your like your coaching philosophy that coach to athlete yeah. relationship like if you can't balance you know their learning yeah. style with your communication style and and be able to go back and forth well then it's almost like any anything you could do is is not going to happen because it's, it's, it's just it's almost like that relationship's broken and that's almost where if someone was to yeah. say you know i i don't want you to be my coach they're like no worries like i'd prefer yeah. you to have someone yeah. that you could you like communicate well with and i've got plenty of mates i can you know refer to that that could more than happily take care of you Oh, absolutely. Look, everyone's got to find the person that gels for them and I get, and everyone needs a good team around them. So, you yeah. know, um, when you're wanting to pursue greatness, you can't do it alone. Um, yeah. But you'd be foolish to think you have to rely on other people to get you there as well. So, mm. you know, um, you know, I heard a quote the other day. I'm thinking of who it was. It was, um, uh, it's off the movie Pursuit of Happiness. So, um, okay. Will Smith's lead actor, yeah. but um, the main character, who, who yeah. it's a based on a true story. Yeah. He, his mother told him that the cavalry ain't coming. You know, you've yeah. got to do this on your own. You, you can't just yeah. sit here and wait for someone to escalate you. You, you, you need to show some initiation and put some yeah. bloody hard work in, but you can't, in equal terms, you can't do it alone fully. No yeah. man is an island. You do need help. And so that yeah. means... In my opinion, every athlete needs a good physical preparation coach or strength conditioning yeah. coach, good physio, you know, yeah. a good tactical coach. And there might be different types of coaches or mentors on, on board, but we're talking about partnerships now. It's not just two way. It's not just two people. It's now multiple people in a team that should be all talking with yeah. each other. So, you know, and that's another common fault that I see um, is that we have multiple coaches involved with an athlete that don't talk to each other. Um, Actually, and therefore, part of the workshop. In or touch onto something and don't realise they might be stepping on the toes of someone else's advice yeah. and might be going against that advice. So you've got the poor athlete in the middle who's now confused. Yeah. Um, and, and all because we wanted to get into a dick measuring contest uh, <laughs> and go, I know this um, because I'm such and such and I've got this expertise and blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. And this is what you should be doing. You should trust me. And then the athlete goes, oh, well, that's different to what he said or she said, and he's got these qualifications. And I, look, I've dealt with it many times. Um, oh, the thing I that, that I whole do, conversation. you just got to ring up the coaches. You've got to talk to them. You've got to have some platform. There's no yeah. excuses today with technology. We've got, mm. you know, at work here, I, we use Microsoft Teams. There's Trello. There's all sorts of project management systems we can use today yeah. where we can have an athlete signed up and we've got coaches on board and there's a clear plan of attack. Yeah. You know, when I went to the hospital, um, we used to have, team, you know, they still do today, team meetings where we would sit down and discuss clients or patients and what on earth are we doing with each one of these? What's mm. their, what are their goals? When are they going to leave hospital? Um, 
et cetera, et cetera. And we have those chats before we waltz out there and deliver the services we have to yeah. deliver. Those chats happen weekly. Yeah. Um, so you think if you were working in an, in an actual physical organization uh, and you had 10 staff, um, that's fine. You can just go to each other's office or whatever, open space and chat. Oh, what are you doing with X? Well, blah, blah, it's fine. But we don't often see ourselves in those positions as coaches. Um, we have athletes who come to us who might play for many cricket clubs, might play for a, a really a local team and then they might play a district level that they might go overseas and play county cricket. Yeah. Um, they're all playing under different people and they're getting a wide array of experiences and so on, but they're also being told lots of different things. Yeah. And the poor athlete, especially one who's very trusting, will take everything that's said with a grain of, you know, oh, yeah. that's gospel. I, I will enact on that. They find mm. themselves doing, trying to please everyone yeah. and trying to do everything. Uh, and, and it's a big mistake. And so one thing Murph Hughes actually said to me as well uh, was to have a performance diary or a training diary where you just log the things that people have told you. Um, have you tried it? Yes or no? Did it seem to work for you? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So you make a note who told, who told you when you did it, what was the result, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. You keep a log of that. It doesn't need to be sophisticated. And, and then when things are going awry in your career or, or, or whatever, you can always go back to that, that diary. And I think it's really useful. You can go back and go, ah, oh, I was doing X, Y, Z. And that's mm. what I was bowling really well. I wasn't overthinking or I was sleeping this many hours. I was, I'd maybe engaged in a bit of mental preparation routine the night before. I packed my bag a certain way. I had my clothes all laid out a certain mm. way. It could be all sort of anything that you'd pick up and go, oh, maybe it was that. I was, it was something that just got me in the, in the mode for cricket. I was fired up. Everyone's different in how they approach the game. You yeah. know, some, some people aren't as meticulous. Like Mr. Cricket, you know, Mike Hussey, he, he was he was a stickler for, for over-preparing, you know, and mentally preparing and getting really into the, into the thick of it. Some players aren't like that. They yeah. just bring it, you know, and this comes back to personality. Um, and so we need to understand that. But bottom line that is... that story you know, about Hayden and um, Gilchrist? Yeah. Against um, um, South Africa, against Pollock? Oh, you have to educate me on this one. Oh, I, I heard this from someone and, and they were saying that during their team meeting, I think Pollock must have done really, really well in that like first one day or something. And one of them might not have been playing, but, you know, during the team meeting, they were all like, you know, so, so what are we going to do? How are we going to handle him? He's, he's the number one Odo bowler in the world. And it was either Hader Hadden who said, don't worry, we got it. We were like, oh, which plan? We're going to smash him. And I think Hayden, second ball of the game, <laughs> walked down the track, pumped him over the top. He went for 100 runs in that ODI. And I just thought, right, okay. how's that for you, you know, for, you, for okay, your preparation? Well, I've actually experienced, I've experienced this onslaught before with a guy who was almost exactly like Matt Hayden. Yeah. I remember playing at Essendon um, in a, a Downing Shield game, so pathways cricket, and I got the bowling, and I was doing pretty well in the competition for our yeah. team anyway. And first ball, I bowled to this left-hander. Um, he walked down the wicket and tonked me over my head in our Windy Hill Essendon um, ground, yeah. as, uh, as you may know, you've probably yeah. played on it a few times. Um, wide boundaries, but short, short yeah. um, vertically. Um, mm -hmm. Just tonked me over the head, straight, straight into the stands. First ball, I went, what? Like, I was <laughs> rattled. I, was, I did not expect that. That really threw me off. Yeah. So when you get a when, a, when and Fortune favours the brave. Absolutely mm -hmm. does. In life, in cricket, in general, those who are brave, willing to take a risk, it can normally, it often pays off. You make your own life, right? So he, he just said, nah, stuff it, I'm going to go after him. Yeah. And, and he did. He, he tonked me around the park. I lost confidence. Went, whoo. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, what do I do? So I changed. I went around the wicket. Um, <laughs> nah, it didn't stop him. He just, he, and he ended up making 100 yeah. as well. Like, and it was impressive. Like, Hats off. He, he uh, you know, he barely, yeah. <laughs> he, I don't know, man. Like he, he didn't give away too many chances. He just took the game on. So yeah. I think you know, life and cricket favours those people who want to take it on. Um, that mindset you know, goes they often the say just generally. Like I love yeah. thinking about well, the I tell mindset you, of someone no who... Attacking. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they... when you go in your shell and, and you get all defensive in your mindset, you normally have inferiority about you and your body language. Yeah. 
and um, you normally get what you deserve. So, yeah. um, you know, you deserve, like, I remember I was on six ducks in a row. I walked out the bat and everyone knew I was on six ducks. So mm. they decided to let me know about it and say, oh, here's number seven coming. And sure yeah. enough, number seven happened. Yeah. Because I, I went out there and also thought number seven would happen too. Um, <laughs> well, a lot happened the last six, you know. Um, I remember yeah, that's self-sabotage. Like, yeah. It's oh, so it, real. So you, um, I walked out there going, oh, I hope, hope I don't go out. I hope I don't yeah, go out. That's it. Now, I, I made the seventh duck. I went, got home. I was pretty upset. I decided to ring my dad about it, who was um, a genius when it comes to mental performance. Yeah. Um, you know, no longer with us, but he mm. he said to me, I don't know what your problem is. And I went, excuse me? And he goes, if I was you, I'd be telling him to say, fucking hurry up and bowl the ball so he can hit me for six. You can't yeah. or something like, you know, yeah. really aggressive. I'm like, yeah. whoa. Yeah, man. Like, so in that season, my average was below 10, which was terrible mm. for me. I was a better batsman than that. And I knew that. I came back the next year and I had a bit more of an aggressive attitude, especially mm. when um, the fellow Jack Rhodes um, uh, come and play for us at Briley. Uh, Jack went on to play Premier Cricket uh, for Essendon and so on. So he his stance was like two or three metres down the wicket mm. um, and it was open stance and first ball, it didn't matter. First ball, second ball, that was just how he stood and he's like, bring it on. And mm. I remember watching him and I went, did he do that? That's <laughs> what? Is he up against yeah. the fastest balls of the competition. What? What are you doing, man? But he took the game on. Now there's mm. some games he made nothing, but there's some games he blasted opposition away. Yeah. And now that's what they say about X factors, don't they? You know, they can just turn the game on its head like that, and yeah. and they rather pick a team of X factors than a team of, you know. I guess what they really know, they've got, you know, conservative players, um, are not willing to take a risk and take yeah. the game on, too scared to make the a move. Timid mindset, but, yeah. Yeah, you've got to just take the game on. Like, um, it's amazing how many times where as a batter, you know, you can throw a bowler off their rhythm just by yeah. walking down the wicket and talking them over the head. Premeditated, yes. It looks might look overly, yes, but you might get away for four or something. And all of a sudden the confidence drops a little bit from there and their rhythm drops. You might move around your crease a bit. You just start doing something a bit different and it throws them and you can see it throw them off. Now, we don't do enough thinking from, you know, a batting and bowling perspective around rhythm, right? It's not coached a lot. It's not thought about a lot. But mm. disrupting harm harmony, <laughs> disrupting what's in here is the key. You know, I had a good battle. thought about that. Just just around mindset and, and some of the things I've noticed is that you might have a negative outcome like in your mind, like as in, I don't want to go out for a duck. I don't want to bowl a white. I don't want to get hit for six as opposed to some sort of a positive outcome. What you yeah. want to happen. I want to bowl out of stump. I want to bowl a Yorker. It's like when someone says, I don't want to bowl a white. Well, if all you're thinking about is manifesting this don't bowl a white, all you think about is the white and you're going to bowl it there. Yeah, if people get taught right. like what you want to do, you know, you're probably yeah. not going to be as, as, as tensed up. You can, Relax your yeah. shoulders, take a breath, like smoothly go into it. And I reckon people are going to find rhythm so much easily doing that. Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of, how do I? <laughs> well, I hope you guys enjoyed part one of the coaching conversation with Simon. I hope you got lots out of it. Like I said before, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them below. And if you do feel like subscribing and being notified when I post the next one up, you know, feel free to, to do that. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to email me. And uh, as always, I, I hope you guys have a, have a wonderful day.